On Saturday, we marked the 20th anniversary of September 11, 2001, the day when the terror group Al-Qaeda crashed two passenger planes into the World Trade Center in New York. Another jet crashed into the Pentagon outside Washington, D.C., and a fourth crashed into a Pennsylvania field after passengers famously fought back. Thousands died, and the world has never been the same since. The first plane hit the North Tower at 8.46 a.m. Initially, there was widespread confusion about exactly what had happened. But while covering the aftermath of the first plane, news cameras caught the second flying into the South Tower. As the towers burned before the eyes of the world, it emerged that two more planes had been hijacked, one which crashed into the Pentagon at 9.37 a.m. Meanwhile, the Twin Towers were consumed in flames as fuel from the jets burned out of control. It's estimated that hundreds of people jumped to their deaths to escape the unimaginable heat of the fires. The towers collapsed, raising a cloud of toxic dust over downtown New York. People fled in terror, unable to see, covered in debris and soot, trying to get away. In the end, almost 3,000 people from dozens of nations died that day. The US government declared its war on terror soon after, and now, 20 years later, it's unclear if there was a winner. An attack that shocked the US and its allies into action. After September 11th, the US and Western Europe felt threatened by a new menace, international terrorism on a mass scale. The reaction from Washington was swift. Make no mistake. The United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Within a month, the U.S. launched Operation Enduring Freedom, also known as the War on Terror. First stop Afghanistan, where the Taliban hosted al-Qaeda. This was the first time NATO joined the U.S. in pursuing military action. Major combat operations in Afghanistan were over within months, but the war on terror became a catch-all phrase used to justify a wide variety of policies. The U.S. passed the Patriot Act, giving the government sweeping surveillance powers. America jailed war prisoners and suspected terrorists in a notorious prison at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba where some are still awaiting trial almost two decades later. Airport security worldwide was ramped up. Ever stricter procedures covering liquids and even shoes were introduced as new bomb plots against planes were discovered. And the war on terror was used as a partial justification for the war in Iraq in 2003, with significantly less international support than the war in Afghanistan. The death toll in Iraq spiraled into the hundreds of thousands as the U.S. intervention unleashed sectarian warfare. Within a few years, the tide of international opinion turned against the U.S. The revelation of torture practices at U.S. facilities in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as secret sites, rocked the international community. When the U.S. later reduced its forces in Iraq, the so-called Islamic State arose out of the chaos on the ground, taking territory and inspiring its followers to commit bloody attacks around the world. Meanwhile, in Afghanistan, the Taliban were back. Civilian deaths continued to mount, with international patience fraying and the cost exceeding a trillion dollars, the U.S. tried to change course. In 2013, President Barack Obama announced the end of Operation Enduring Freedom. Tonight, I can announce that over the next year, another 34,000 American troops will come home from Afghanistan. This drawdown will continue. And by the end of next year, our war in Afghanistan will be over. That ended up taking seven more years. Al-Qaeda and the groups inspired by it have not been able to pull off another 9-11. But the price in deaths strained alliances, and now the return of the Taliban to power after 20 years has been extremely high. 
Well, joining us for more now from New York City is Lauren Manning. She survived the 9-11 terror attacks and has written extensively about the events of September 11, 2001. Lauren, welcome to the program. I wonder, 20 years on, have you managed to rationalise what happened to you that day? Well, uh, the word rationalisation is one that I could never apply to the, the history of what happened, certainly to myself in 2001 or in 1993. I was also there during the first bombing. I think uh, to just play on that word, it is the most irrational act when people uh, take their personal animus out on civilians. And unfortunately, uh, that is what happened that day. It was the worst domestic attack on U.S. soil, and it affected tens of thousands of people, ultimately, that were not only wounded as I was, but murdered, and latently so many with disease. Surrounded by utter madness at those moments, when were you first able to realise, to put the pieces together and understand that you were indeed in the middle of a terror attack? Well, as I entered the building, the first jet was crashed into the upper floors, United Flight 711. The fuel exploded and pummeled down the elevator shafts. I was enveloped in the fire. I had no idea at that moment what was going on. I was in the fight for my life just to breathe, to try to get back out the doors. It was only when the backdraft released and blew out the windows that I was in many ways pushed out with hurricane force winds back on the street where I'd been moments before. And after I finally got across the six lanes of highway to drop and roll and look back up, uh, it was not that long thereafter that the second plane hit the South Tower. And at that moment, I knew that it was not a commercial plane or a you know, small plane that made a mistake, that it was an intended attack. You suffered the most devastating injuries with burns to more than 80% of your body. Your chances of survival were almost zero, zero. Do you ever ask yourself, not just the nature of how you survived, but when so many others perished, do you ask yourself why you survived? I don't actually ask myself why I understood in those moments that the easier choice would have been to die, but I did not even believe that death would release me from the pain. And so I made a choice and I decided to live. That I actually did survive was because of tenacity, resilience, luck, and uh, less luck than many had that day who were not scathed or who weren't there. But I knew as I watched bodies come pummeling to the ground <laughs> that some of those were my colleagues, my friends from Kenner Fitzgerald. And I had the slimmest chance to fight. And the way I figured it was I had a 10-month-old son. I didn't want to abandon him. And I wasn't going to let them get one more on the kill list. And so it was as simple as that equation. When you talk about those uh, atrocious things, you talk about 9-11 today, what is there? Is there one dominant emotion from all of that? The most dominant emotion for me is the heroism that people who were not clothed in uniforms showed each other that day, the grace of colleagues and friends and strangers helping each other. I had someone help me that day. In 1993, I helped a woman down the blackened stairwell. I think that the most resonant piece for it is the grace we show one another in the times that seem the darkest and most hopeless. And the notion that we, we all have such unmeasured strength and it's moments that galvanize a people, a society, the world, much as we've seen now in the pandemic, the uh, situation going on in Afghanistan and in many other areas of the world. When we come together and we lay down our arms at the sides of 
looking into someone's eyes. You see nothing but the earnest desire to help and, and pray and hope for someone else that they too um, may get better. And I think that is really what I feel most deeply about the day. You know, we honor the dead and we hope for better times, uh, but man's <laughs> primitive nature certainly shows us that's probably not the way it'll go. As you speak to um, a better day coming, 9-11 is a day that shook the world. Do you think Americans who witnessed that day will ever truly recover? My father was a former Marine and he said, things are going to happen. You're not the first one they've happened to. And when they do, there's only one way to go. Have your pity party and you've got to move forward. So I think it's indelibly imprinted on the minds of every, every American. It is part of our history. It is part of world history. Uh, but I think at this point, 20 years later, we have the ability to look at it with a greater perspective. Sadly, one we needed in light of the events that have been transpiring over the last year and a half. Lauren, it's great to speak to you and uh, we wish you the best. 9-11 survivor, author, entrepreneur and businesswoman. Well, DW's Enos Pohl is at Ground Zero in New York City for us. Enos, welcome. Uh, what's the city like as Americans uh, preparing to mark this 20th anniversary? Anthony, we've been here since the early morning hours and more and more people come from all around the country to commemorate this very moment. I just talked to Michael, who lost his mom in the South Tower. He put out a sign here at the memorial with pictures of uh, his wife, whom he just married, telling the story, telling his mom how much he still misses her. And that's the mood here. People are very silent. People are crying. They're holding hands. This brings back all the horror from 20 years ago. Enos, how will New Yorkers be marking this day? Well, there is a huge uh, ceremony, a ceremony tomorrow here uh, in New York at Ground Zero. It will start exactly at 8.49 in the morning. That's when the first plane hit the tower. Uh, it will begin with a moment of silence. Then the family members of the nearly 3,000 victims will read the names and throughout two and a half hours or so, there will be moments of silence to remember uh, the other planes hitting into the other towers when the towers went down also when the plane crashed into the Pentagon and the other plane was brought down in Pennsylvania. So this will be a moment where all the names will be read, but also with, with the six or seven minutes of silence in the whole city of New York. In a sense, Americans remember the events that started the, the war on terror. Is the end of the war now a, an undignified exit from Afghanistan? Is that now in any way part of this 9-11 narrative? For the political uh, uh, people, I shall say, or uh, for people who are really interested in politics, this plays a huge, huge role and the whole uh, day will be kind of overshadowed by the withdrawal from Afghanistan, Anthony. But if you talk to the people here at the very ground zero, they really, their hearts really go out to the victims because we have to keep in mind, this was really a day when not only 3,000 or nearly 3,000 people got killed, but really this hit the United States in the heart. It shook this country in many, many Western alliances as well. And this, I think, is the, the uh, dominating feeling, at least here at Ground Zero in New York. Ines Paul in New York City, thank you very much. Well, the 9-11 attacks had a German con connection too, of course. Three of the four hijackers who piloted the planes were based in the northern German city of Hamburg, where they attended university. The Egyptian, Mohammed Atta, was the man considered their leader. Hamburg, a big city, a university town. Inside this building is retired Professor Dittmar Mahula's office. He guided Mohammed Atta's doctoral dissertation on city planning. 
Atta was called Amir at the time. Professor Mahula was shocked when he found out that Atta, his own student, was one of the pilots of the planes that flew into the World Trade Center. I knew another version of him. I knew Mohammed El Amir, a young student like so many others, but with the difference that he was a Muslim here in Hamburg. He was very observant and engaged. When I ask myself if I missed something, nothing comes to me. Atta lived close to the university in a rental apartment. He held meetings here with other Islamists. Three of the four September 11th suicide pilots lived in Hamburg in the years before the attack. His old professor can only guess why this particular ambitious student became so radicalized. Like many young people who are ambitious and intelligent, Mohammed wanted to make a contribution of some kind. And he never got that kind of recognition, including from me, nor from anyone else here. We didn't have those kinds of conversations. But apparently they had them in the Al Quds Mosque. That mosque was heavily influenced by Salafism, a hardline branch of Islam. Atta and other 9-11 attackers attended several times. The mosque has since been closed. It was on the authorities' radar as a meeting point of potential Islamists, as the authorities later admitted. We were close, closer than we realized. We knew some of the individuals, but we couldn't see the structures that were in place. And above all, we didn't know what they were up to. What they were up to was preparing the September 11th attacks. Several men traveled to Afghanistan for training. Then, a few months before September 11th, Mohammed Atta showed up in Professor Mahula's class. I noticed that someone was there. I looked up, and it was Mohammed, looking at me in his usual way. And I said, Mohammed, great, where have you been? I haven't seen you for ages. Wait a moment, we're almost done. I gave the rest of my lecture, but when I was done, he was gone. Mahula is sure that it was Atta's way of saying goodbye. So. Joining us now is retired Army Colonel Chris Collender. He's the first American to have both fought the Taliban as a commander in combat and engaged them in peace talks. He's also an author and consultant on security and leadership. Chris, welcome to the program. The 9-11 attacks were unprecedented, so too was the reaction. 20 years later, can we now say the war on terror was the right response? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on your program. I remember where I was, of course, many of us do, on September 11th. I was at the War College, and uh, the first plane had already hit when one of the instructors came in and said, hey, turn on the television. And uh, we turned on the television in time to see the second plane hit the World Trade Center. and. You know, one plane might have been an accident, two planes, it was an attack. And uh, we knew, all of us, since we were all serving officers there in the War College, that our lives were going to fundamentally change. Um, I deployed to Afghanistan from Germany, so my unit was uh, stationed in Schweinfurt, uh, Germany. And, um, you know, when I think about those deployments and that deployment in particular, um, you know, I, I also think about my appreciation for the support that we had from the communities in Schweinfurt and Würzburg um, and, and other places where our soldiers lived. And I just wanted to give my appreciation for that. And, and fair enough, too. Uh, just returning to the question, can we now say that the war on terror, uh, as understandable as it was, um, was the right response? Was it an effective response at combating terrorism? Well, there's a couple of ways to answer that. The, the first one is that you know, we live history forward, uh, but we examine history backwards. And so at the time when the United States had just gotten uh, hit 
in 9-11. Uh, Al Qaeda senior leadership was in Afghanistan and from where the attacks were planned and, and supported. Um, and the Taliban refused to hand them over. I mean, you could understand this was, I, I always felt as a soldier fighting in the war that this was a just war that we were fighting justly. Uh, now, when you look in hindsight, when you look back on, there were plenty of mistakes and challenges. I write about these in Zero Sum Victory, um, own goals, if you will. I write about these in Zero Sum Victory, and they happen in both Iraq and Afghanistan, mm -hmm. uh, where we made many unforced, many of these unforced errors that in some ways, in many ways, uh, create made the terrorism problem um, worse today, more more proliferating um, today yeah. than it had been in 2001. That, that leads me to the next question. Some estimates say we spent $8 trillion and 900,000 lives were lost. Has all of that made us safer than we were in 2001? Well, it's too soon to tell in a place like Afghanistan. Um, so, you know, in the 2,300 American service members who were killed in action, uh, $2,000, um, you, you know, two trillion, excuse me, two trillion U.S. dollars um, that we spent um, 20 years. And that, that's just the United States, not to mention uh, the sacrifices that our allies have made. I mean, to see at the end of that, the Afghan government evaporate, the Afghan people vote with their feet to abandon that government that had abandoned them many, many years ago and accept the Taliban. I mean, it's, it's, difficult, to, it's difficult to watch that all happen. Um, with respect to Afghanistan, I think the United States and the international community have three main near-term objectives. The first one is to continue the evacuations of uh, people who worked for our governments, of our our citizens who want to get out. Um, yeah. Second is the, are the humanitarian and human rights concerns. Uh, 20 million Afghans are on the verge of starvation, facing severe food and water uh, shortages. We all know that human rights challenges in Afghanistan, particularly women's rights. I mean, Afghanistan, even before this, was rated as the second worst place in the world to be mm -hmm. a woman. And then you've got the economic collapse that's ongoing. And then third is is the, the counterterrorism. And you know, right now it's entirely understandable if people want to turn their backs in frustration on Afghanistan. But I think if we do so, it makes all three problems worse. If we continue yeah. engaging uh, with Afghanistan, then we have a chance of at least addressing those three objectives. Global security expert and analyst Christopher Colander, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Well, Glenn Carl is a former CIA officer who spent the last of his 23 years in the agency running interrogations, looking for the man responsible for the terror attacks on the United States. Mr Carl, welcome to the program. You played a central role in the war on terror, which we'll get to in a moment. But I wanted to ask, firstly, about your state of mind today and how you'll be spending your weekend marking 20 years since the 9-11 attacks. Well, it is 20 years, but uh, I won't be <clears throat> commemorating it in any particular way. I think the most disturbing uh, aspect of the 20-year commemoration to me is uh, that it has been 20 years that um, the United States and therefore the world focus has been distorted uh, by the, quote, uh, war on terror. Uh, there are of course, and there were and still are uh, terrorists, Islamic terrorists who are trying to kill me or you, uh, but uh, they need not have defined the foreign and domestic policies of the most powerful country on earth for 20 years. Where were you on September 11th in 2001? I had just been uh, reassigned, changed my uh, assignment uh, and had arrived in Washington on September First, um, actually, on September 1st, I had a final business meeting at the World Trade Tower um, in New York, uh, and then uh, that was literally the last thing that I did in, in New York, and then I, I drove down to Washington. 
the day of the attack, I was in my office um, and uh, not directly involved in uh, any terrorist or terrorism-related uh, operation at that moment. So I was an observer. So after that shock that you surely felt came the anger for many millions of people. But the vast majority of those angry masses didn't get to do anything about it, whereas you, months later, you were the one chosen of the few to find the most wanted man on the planet. Did you carry any personal anger into that professional pursuit of Osama bin Laden? I think, uh, yes, I think all of us uh, were, uh, of course, angry that someone had uh, killed uh, thousands of people who had nothing to do with anything other than being Americans, and many of them were not Americans. Uh, just uh, victims of a terrorist act. And terrorism is designed to uh, change, uh, strike fear and to change the political feelings of a population rather than uh, to strike a specific objective against of a government. Uh, so uh, sure, I was angry in that sense, but uh, Al-Qaeda and its terrorist acts were nothing new to me or to many of my colleagues. I had been working on Al-Qaeda uh, at times for five years prior to uh, the attack of 9-11. So many of us had been quite focused for a long time. That anger that you, you speak to, it, it fueled a, rap a rapid response, a shock and awe response. But did it help or hinder finding Bin Laden? Well, emotions are never good things uh, in uh, any policy making or any uh, act that needs to be or action that, that needs to be reasoned. Uh, rather than anger, I think the primary uh, error uh, that has affected much of the world, actually, uh, is that we have been literally, I'm not being insulting here, uh, deluded by our uh, fears. So that we, uh, fear is always far more powerful uh, than reason. And uh, we react as humans instinctively to a perceived threat uh, far out of proportion to its uh, uh, more objective, assessed uh, danger. And, and that has driven, uh, certainly it did early on, uh, much of the uh, war and terror's initial construction and actions. And that, uh, that, that has been tragic. You were in charge of interrogating the man thought to be Osama bin Laden's banker. You eventually came to think he was innocent. In your book titled The Interrogator and Education, you wrestled with the question, if what you did was torture. Nearly 20 years later, do you have a firm answer for yourself? Well, I didn't have any doubt then. Uh, there was no question that uh, what uh, part of my institution, part of the CIA, CIA, had been instructed to do was torture. There was no question about that at all. The dilemma was for me and for, for many of my colleagues was what would I do? How could I uh, achieve my orders, my mission, uh, and yet honor my oath to the Constitution uh, and not, therefore, of course, uh, engage in anything uh, remotely like uh, uh, torture. That was the challenge. And, and the way I framed it at the time in my mind was uh, when will I have to say no? And uh, that point was reached at different times in different ways uh, by many uh, different people. But it was instantaneously clear to me from the first minute, literally from the first minute that I was briefed on the program that we were talking about torture. There was no question in my mind. Two decades after the planes hit the Twin Towers, 19 years after you joined the war effort with a, a key counterterrorism brief, can you tell me who won the war on terror? In the narrow sense of uh, the initial United States objective uh, for the CIA, for the military, for the government, was to destroy Al Qaeda. Uh, and other jihadist uh, terrorist groups. From that perspective, uh, the United States and, and uh, US allies have had uh, dramatic successes. Al Qaeda continues to exist, but is a, a shade, a shadow of what it once was. Now, the problem for, in terrorism is that it only takes one person to kill many others. And terrorism has morphed over the past 20 years from uh, a group like Al-Qaeda, which is hierarchical, 
and has a commander and orders and plans to uh, the greater threat now, uh, which is from what we call inspired jihadists or inspired terrorists, someone who identifies with the ideology or the theology uh, and may take a vague bit of guidance from some entity, but acts fundamentally without any command and control structure. That's a far harder challenge. Right. So in the larger sense, the um, many of our actions have had uh, have counterproductive results. And I think the larger uh, challenge uh, has been what does the Muslim world on the whole uh, think about uh, jihadist terrorism like al-Qaeda and bin Laden engaged in? And there, um, although the threat continues and people continue to suffer from terrorist attacks, I think we have seen a positive evolution uh, among uh, Muslims who are substantially more hostile overall to uh, something like an al-Qaeda attack than they were 20 years ago. So it's a mixed um, uh, balance sheet, uh, narrowly uh, positive with regard to al-Qaeda and organizations, negative uh, in the way the consequences for Western societies and what uh, we have uh, done. Uh, and, and yet, I think long-term positive, painful as that might be to say uh, or to think, um, that uh, Islam is evolving past a, a visceral hostility uh, towards Western norms that would lead to uh, murder and mayhem. Glenn Carl, a national security expert in Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you so much. Anytime. Almost 3,000 people died on September 11th. Most of the victims were in the World Trade Center, but thousands also managed to escape before the towers collapsed. One of the people who was in the World Trade Center that morning was Wendy Lansky. She told DW's Oliver Sallet what she experienced on that fateful September morning. It was a beautiful day, sunny, clear, and was just expecting a regular boring day. I was on the 29th floor of Tower One. I took the elevator up to my office. I was sitting at my desk. And on Tuesdays, we had a regular status meeting every week. So I was kind of shuffling some papers and getting some agendas ready and was literally getting up from my chair of my desk when I felt an incredible sound and thud and felt the building shake. And that's when I knew it was never going to be a regular day. It was a large impact, like a, a crashing sort of a sound. And then the building swayed a little bit ever so slightly. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see debris out the window. And then I heard the sound of people jumping and the connection of those people to the ground, which I will never, ever forget. So we just headed towards the stairwell, opened up the, the doors, and proceeded our exodus down 29 flights of stairs. And after I saw probably the second or third fireman, I said to him, what exactly hit this building? And he looked at me with this just look of shock, and he said, a jet. I went out into the street, and it looked like a blizzard, like a snowstorm. I couldn't see two feet in front of me. And the ground looked like the beach. Everything was just white and pulverized. And people were screaming, it's coming down, it's coming down, run. I was born and raised in New York. I don't ever want that part of me to go away, and I keep it. And I feel that we need to keep it to honor the memory of 3,000 plus people who died that day 
and then the thousands that have died from 9-11 cancers and diseases since then. I think if we forget, or we even try to forget, we dishonor so many people. Terrorism is not necessarily just the act of committing terrorism, blowing something up, but it's what it does to your soul. The threat of terrorism is in the heart, in my heart, every day. If I hear an unexpected loud noise, if something doesn't look right, if I'm in a crowded place, a regular person might just say, oh, it's a loud noise, a car backfired, or there's thunder. My brain says, where do you go? How do you escape? How do you get out? What do you do? So you don't ever feel whole. You don't ever feel normal. Well, B. William Silcock is a leading global innovator in journalism education. Bill, it's a well-worn phrase we use when describing 9-11, the day that the world changed forever. But I wonder what did it change about journalism in your eyes and covering the government response in the United States? Uh, thanks, Anthony, for an opportunity to share some insights. I'm still reeling in my head from that piece you just had. Wow, what powerful testimony from that woman. I think journalism has changed in three important ways. First of all, technology has changed in the last 20 years. Uh, the news cycle has changed. And maybe the last thing, of course, is the impact of social media. And we now have the end of the news cycle. It's now 24 seven, we're always on. And back then, at least there was a breathing time for journalists to take a breath, look for some depth, double check the facts. Now it's nonstop information machine out there all the time. So that does have a challenge. Um, the other things that have happened in the last 20 years for, for network journalism, I think there was an initial phase where they're gonna be more serious. I mean, we were suddenly attacked. We didn't know what was happening. The, the journalists need to wake up. A more emphasis on serious news, but if you did a content analysis, as academics do, of what's in the rundown or the lineup of the stories every day, they're kind of right back to where they were. There's not a lot of serious news in there. The right. top three or four, 10 stories might be serious, but then the bulk of the newscast is a lot of news that people can use, but not news that's going to help um, get rid of the fear factor of terrorism, for sure. Bill, you spoke a little bit to this question. In 2001, the nightly news was very much still king. They were the voices that spoke to both sides of the political divide. If this happened in today's fragmented digital landscape that you speak of, would the government response face tougher questions sooner? I think so, Anthony. I think they would. I think there's a lot more voices out there, not only international voices like Deutsche Welle, but voices from the blogosphere, voices from the Twitter sphere. So it's not just the White House press corps that's pressing the government or whoever's in charge of the agencies what's going on. There's a lot of other people out there. Do the uh, people in power in those various uh, places in Washington and around the world always pay attention to the rest of them that are not the traditional news meeting? Of course they do, and increasingly they have to. Um, I think one of the other things that happened in, the, in this time of, of, of a period of, is the changing na nature early on of a very patriotic, almost jingoistic journalism style that happened over the first two months especially. People started wearing flag pins on local TV news anchors. People began to question, is that still ethically okay? Are they showing a bias if they have the American flag? Of course not. They were patriotic. Their country had just you know, been attacked by terrorists. But over time, then people began to ask tougher questions about that. And, and what was that like? What was it like for journalists who tried to maintain that impartial voice in these heightened emotions? A non-patriotic voice, maybe, uh, that you said, at a time when the word patriot, it carried such weight with it. Yeah, well, I think, you know, fear brought everybody together, not just first responders, it brought journalists, about average citizens. We were all on the same team. We were all Americans. It was America that was attacked. And then slowly over time, you know, more tougher questions came in. I think there's still an interesting debate, and it's this historical debate to look back and see, uh, you know, who wore a flag and why why not. And, and it wasn't just people that you might think today, well, of course, it was the very conservative media outlets that were wearing the flags. No, that's not true. Um, you know, it harkened back to some other days in the turning points of television news history in the United States, the Kennedy assassination, where for four days we were glued to the screen watching this you know, four day long, basically funeral. And the, the country came together through that process. B. William Silcock, Associate Professor at the Cronkite School. Thanks so much for your insight. Thank you.
Well, the impact of 9-11 was felt everywhere in the world. Almost everyone alive then can tell you where they were and how they heard the news. Well, DW has been around the world to ask people how they remember that day and how it changed their lives. It was definitely very, very like harrowing and haunting and I remember being scared to fly and I think it just kind of riddled me with a lot of anxiety just being so young and like not fully understanding the gravity of what happened but still knowing that something like super tragic happened. As a kid seeing that it definitely impacted like the course of history. I was like wow this is crazy um, and just growing up growing in the U.S. Um, being an avid traveler I see like how things have been shaped. It makes you feel vulnerable, doesn't it? It makes you feel that, you know, you're not untouchable and, and you know, no matter who you are or where you are, um, a tragedy like that can happen. I've become much more aware of things that, that can go wrong uh, when taking an airplane, for instance. They it was frightening because you didn't know if it was something that was happening locally or if it was a worldwide attack. And as a child, you were afraid that it could happen near you, that you might be in some kind of danger. I remember panic. Everyone were panic, um, scared. Um, everyone thought that America is big and protected and boom. Losing so many lives. I, as a superpower, to me, I always thought America is immune to such things. But since then, I think the global security perspective changed. The whole world was terrified because you know that an attack of this magnitude doesn't come out of nowhere. It really instilled fear, the fact that if a very big nation like United States of America can be affected like that, what about us, a third world country? It was obviously traumatic for me as a kid. And then my mother just turned the TV off and says me to my room. It had a big effect on an international level, especially on the wars that came afterwards, the war against terrorism and so on. These attacks fundamentally changed the world.